Madam President, uh, General Secretary, fellow delegates, it's uh, my great honour and pleasure to present to you the Industrial Relations Review for the last year. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Tony Fitzpatrick, the uh, Acting Director of Industrial Relations. I can say from the outset that you're not expecting the first slide, but I was inspired by all the contributions that were made this morning, which clearly indicated that if you stand back, let nurses and midwives at the problem, they will solve the problem, it'll be better for patients, and it'll save money. So, That's the Duchess of Cambridge, or she likes me to call her Kate. They, uh, <laughs> and she's just had her third child, and as you know, three is the new uh, two. They, uh, but uh, on an important point, she's the patron of the Nursing Now campaign. And like the contributions made this morning, the purpose of the Nursing Now campaign is letting nurses and midwives at the problems that affect the 21st century health services throughout the world. And that was launched in February of this year. Uh, the ICN and the WHO are behind it, and Ed Kennedy is intrinsically involved, as is um, Liz Adams, Elizabeth Adams, who has now gone to the Department of Health. So I just wanted to bring your attention to that, the Nursing Now campaign, and familiarise yourself with it, and the INMO will be leading out with regards to that uh, in this jurisdiction. But moving on to the Duchess of Kerry. The, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very important. It's, e it, it's, it's easy for me to make this presentation. By the way, it's a bit of levity at the beginning. It's going to rapidly go downhill after that. <laughs> the, the, uh, as you know, Phil Nihay is my predecessor as the Director of Industrial Relations. Um, and I have to say that a lot of what we're presenting in the annual report and in this presentation was initiated and led out by Phil Niha. Um, it's important, I say Niha, but I was corrected, I think it's Niha, but... No, it's uh, nice. the, okay. The, uh, <laughs> so, anyway, the... Niha um, means no. <laughs> we probably will be saying no. <laughs> but, the reality is, though, that Phil, it's important that we recognise the work that has Phil did as the Director of Industrial Relations and led out with many of these initiatives. You have a saying down here in Cork that has been outlined by two famous rowers uh, that they go out there and pull like a dog. And the reality is that Phil Nihe, in her, in her job as the Director of Industrial Relations Officer, pull like a dog with regards to whether she was pulling at the Department of Health or the HSE to progress the issues for nurses and midwives. So I think it's important that I recognise the valuable work that she has done uh, and that is, in, is, is tied in to the report. <clears throat> I've only 30 seconds of slide, so I have to speed up. But I think it's important, the Industrial Relations uh, Department of the organisation, many of you will be familiar with it, and if anyone's been involved in a grievance procedure or trust and care investigation, dignity at work or disciplinary proceedings, would be well aware of the re excellent representation that is provided um, by the Industrial Relations officers of this organisation. And I'd appreciate if you would acknowledge the valuable work that those Industrial Relations officers and their administrative support do throughout the country. As you can see, there's over 12,840 individual cases that have been dealt with. There's 206 third-party issues, which could be individual issues referred to adjudication, or indeed it could be issues of collective nature that are before the WRC, and obviously matters that go to the Labour Court. It's also important that we acknowledge, as part of the IR department, the valuable work that is done by the Information Office, led by Colette Mullen and supported by Catherine, who is down here on the right, and Colette is at the back, and Karen, who is back in HQ. And I think there's over 6,000 calls that goes into that office every year where people are given guidance and advice, often that the HSE can't give, with regards to their rights and entitlements. And I'd appreciate if you'd acknowledge their valuable work as well.
And as it's outlined there, there's over 11,000 meetings that take place, whether it's local implementation groups, transfer of tasks, I have to stop looking back here, it's here in front of me, collective issues or oversight groups, uh, meetings and steering groups, and many of you would be involved in that uh, throughout the country. The, I'm going to briefly talk about the National Joint Council. The National Joint Council is the primary forum uh, for the management of industrial relations. It involves the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organization working with other unions to progress issues within the health service. And it's an, a very important um, uh, council that exists. And indeed, it's been led by Phil Hay over the last number of years as the chair of that process, and I've taken it over in recent months. And indeed, it's through the good work of Phil and other colleagues that we have progressed many issues of a national nature via that forum. The staff panel is made up of all the unions that are affiliated to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions within the HSC. This is just some of the issues that were on the agenda of the last meeting that took place on the 27th of March this year. It meets every two months and you would have seen in the most recent magazine that we have a, a, a page dedicated to it and we'll continue that over the next uh, every two months. But the issues that were dealt with, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to pick some as, as an example, pension issues, people are retiring and not receiving their pension for many months and indeed for up to a year, which is an absolute disgrace. Um, especially when we have people that are living paycheck to paycheck. The least the HSE can do for people that when they retire after 40 years of dedicated service, looking after patients, they should be entitled to receive their, their pension in a timely manner. And this is not happening and that's a disgrace. I referenced the joint declaration yesterday and that's about CPD and lifelong learning. Um, fixed travel, that's an issue at the moment because PHNs who are familiar with fixed travel, the HSE is operating under a derogation from revenue with regards to tax compliance and the practice of fixed travel will have to be eliminated by the end of this year and we're involved in negotiations with regards to that. The key thing we identified when meeting with the HSE is that many of the practices around mileage and subsistence relates back to the old health boards of 2004 and before. So if you go to the northeast or go to the northwest, the rules are applied as per the old uh, health board structures. And indeed, many of us would uh, like to see the health board structures re uh, put into place rather than at least we knew where the ivory tower was. Not like now, we don't know where the ivory tower is. But there's significant other issues there. Compassionate leave in the civil service has been increased on the death of a spouse or a child to 20 days. However, within the health service, it still remains at five. And the reality is that many nurses and midwives who are in that unfortunate position of losing a spouse uh, or a child, not only take compassionate leave, but often have to go on sick leave um, in order to get some time off that they require uh, with their family. And that's unacceptable that the civil service since January 2017 have an enhanced compassionate leave arrangement while the health service continues to refuse to implement the circular that was applied within the uh, civil service and we're pursuing that matter via the WRC. As I said, there's many other issues there that are on the agenda. The students referenced yesterday about been having to do shifts at night and uh, on premium earnings, etc., without premium earnings, obviously, um, and that there is a circular with regards to that, and we've raised that at the NGC, and clarification is to issue from the HSE with regards to that. You'll be aware as well, the application of the injury grant in Section 38, Intellectual Disability, you've had reference to the number of assaults that are taking place on the front line, often against nurses and midwives. The reality is, though, that people do get assaulted at work, and at least we have an assault at work scheme with regards to that. However, in the intellectual disability sector, in Section 38 organisations, they will only apply the injury grant after you've been assaulted. But if you just get injured in the course of your work, they won't apply the injury grant. We have pursued this matter in the form of Philip McEnany, took the matter to the adjudication service, and they recommended that this issue be dealt with at national level. And we've had a number of meetings with the HSE that are far uh, less than satisfactory, but we continue to pursue that matter as the HSE and the Section 38 uh, organisations. Uh,
There's issues around cat labs. You, this is quite a topical issue, but you have cat labs in St. James's, in the Matter, in Cork, Limerick, and Galway. And they're the ones, sorry, they're the ones that are 24 seven. And you have many other cat labs that work yeah. uh, during core hours. The reality is that the staffing of these have not been appropriate to the work that they do. And we're pursuing that matter uh, with the HSE also. Because you have a requirement at the minute where people are being pulled from the coronary care units to the cat lab to deal with an emergency situation at night. That means that the three nurses that were in the CCU are depleted of a nurse for many hours and to deal with the emergency within the cat lab. And that obviously impacts upon patient care and is less than satisfactory. There's many other issues that we're dealing with within the NJC, but I think as Edward pointed out this morning, if people ever ask the question, what does the INMO ever do for me? You'll be able to answer that question and clearly say that at national and local level, we're pursuing many issues to protect nurses and midwives on the front line. The, the Joint Information and Consultation Forum meets every four times a year. That's some of the issues that have been dealt with. I think the draft strategy for doctors' health and well-being is a very welcome one, and we've sought that a similar one be introduced for nurses and midwives, and we're working through with regards to that. Just the pension improvement program. It was interesting at the most recent meeting of the JICF that the pension uh, area within the HSE advised us that uh, they're not compliant uh, with the regulations with regards to pensions. For example, those of you on the single scheme that came in since 2013, you don't get your annual statement. That's a requirement that you're provided with an annual statement, and the HSE advised that it'll be September 2019 before they're able to provide people with annual statements. So that just shows you how dysfunctional the HSE is. <laughs> the other issue that to be addressed via the NJC is policies and procedures. You may not be aware of this, but due again to work that Phil did and the unions were involved with, the HSE was amending policies and procedures without agreement with the various unions that represented the staff that were affected by that. The reality is, you'll remember the five claims that went through the Labour Court, the staff handbook that was amended without that engagement. So now, these policies are presented to the staff panel of the NGC uh, for agreement. There are 24 policies here that have been agreed in the last 12 months. And again, you'll see the most relevant ones there, your service, your say, safe driving, manual handling and people handling. The INMO has had an input into that, and I would like to thank the IR subcommittee of the Executive Council, the Executive Council and the Industrial Relations Officers who assist me in examining those policies in order to get them corrected. The one at the top there, HSE Policy and Prevention and Management of Stress, they're doing a pretty bad job with regards to that to date. The older person section, I've dealt with this yesterday. The HSE are attempting to implement cost of care and reduce the staffing and skill mix. It's a financial decision that's detrimental to the health and well-being of staff, but also detrimental to the patients. There are many beds closed throughout the system at the moment due to a lack of staffing. We'll come back to this later in the slide where recruitment and retention is a major problem, but not just in the high activity areas like theatres and ICU, but in older person services in the community and throughout the health service, and it's an issue that needs to be addressed. The INMO is involved in negotiations locally. It could be Joe as the official down in Dungarvan, Mary and Claire, Maura up in Carrick on Shannon, myself in Virginia. I've just run out of the list, uh, but with regards to Liam Hogue and Cork as well, where there's attempts to reduce staffing, there's attempts to open beds without having adequate staffing and skill mix in place, and we must say no to that and defend that all the time. One little anecdote, with regards to St. Fimber's Hospital, those in Cork would be familiar with it. The HSE proposed last year that they'd cut the staffing and HCA numbers by 21%. So they decided, sorry, it was 19%, there was 21 posts. And since last year, those posts have been filled by agency at a premium cost of 33%. They still won't accept, you, and I'd imagine the first thing you would ask me, if they're saying they're gonna cut staff by that amount, they obviously have a systematic and scientific explanation of why they would reduce the staffing by that amount. We saw that. We sought that in the WRC, 
and to date we have not received it. However, we're able to put forward a systematic and scientific approach that clearly says that those staff are required and should be kept within the service. But due to their, I was going to use the word stupidity, but similar to that, uh, they have not uh, dealt with this issue and for the last year have been paying a 33% premium by employing staff via agency than employing them directly. It's ridiculous and unacceptable. I talked about these yesterday. These are the older person's uh, key principles around staffing and skill mix, um, and we continue to pursue that agenda. Task sharing extended to the social care set setting. You'll recall that this has been introduced. The time one six payment has been returned in the acute setting. However, in social care, we had to pursue that issue vigorously. As a result of that, a circular was issued last year that from the 1st of July 2017, staff working in older person facilities and intellectual disability should receive the payment of time on 1 6 between 6 and 8 p.m. or to the end of their shift. Now you'd imagine that when the HSE issues a circular, that within the HSE, because it's a circular to themselves, the managers would be able to implement it. Unfortunately, up till February, many locations hadn't implemented. I was involved in the national implementation and verification process, and indeed on Valentine's Day, unfortunately, I was here in Cork dealing with that issue. And uh, not fortunately, obviously. Uh, <laughs> Freudian slip. They, uh, but it was clearly articulated by senior HR within the HSC to CHO Area 4 that that payment should have been made since the 1st of July last year. And you would think that as a result of national HR who have already put it in writing for them and have written to them further to that meeting that they would pay that money. The reality is that for all the nurses and midwives in Cork and Kerry in CHO Area 4 that are delivering care to the ID sector and to the older person sector, as I stand here before you today, have still not been paid that money that should have been paid from the 1st of July last year. Again, an example of the bureaucracy, the, the systems that exist within the HSE that blocks them from doing their job. The issue, though, that's very important with regards to this, there may be payment restored, and that is the case. There's 50% retrospection, which is approved for payment as well, so people in those sectors will receive a time on six payment from the 1st of July 2017, retrospective to the 1st of February 2017, and that's due to you, and a circular is due to implement. And hopefully at next year's conference, that money will actually be paid. There's an ongoing national implementation and verification process with regards to that. But the most important thing with this initiative is the fact that tasks have transferred into the ID and older person services via the task sharing process, where nurses and midwives are carrying out functions that they didn't do before, whether it's cannulation, venipuncture, catheterization. And what does that mean for patients? It's a bit like what we heard this morning. As a result of that, someone that requires a catheterization or indeed requires IV antibiotics can stay in their residence, can stay in the nursing home. They do not have to get into an ambulance, be escorted by a nurse to a busy emergency department to wait for 12 or 24 hours to receive a diagnosis that they have an infection and they require an antibiotic. Instead of that, they can stay in their home, their residence, the, the, the nursing home or the older person's facility and receive that care. And here's another example of that. Again, of nurses stand back, let nurses and midwives at the problem and they'll solve the problem. It'll be better for the patient and it'll save them money. But in the intellectual disability sector, we heard one story where one client a resident of, that, of, of, of this facility in the West. Whenever, and bloods needed to be done on a regular basis due to the medication that they were on, that on that regular basis, that person had to be transported to a, an acute hospital. That person had to be sedated and anesthetized in order to have the bloods taken. But as a result of task sharing and the transfer of tasks to nurses, those bloods are now done by the RNID, the Registered Nurse and in Intellectual Disability. But furthermore, furthermore, that patient or that resident or that client, because they trust the RNID, because they know the RNID will not hurt them, does not have to be sedated or anesthetized anymore. And again, that demonstrates the value for money for the service, but also for the, for the patient. 
Healthcare System Review, I talked about that yesterday, and I'm not going to go into it in any further detail. That'll report in the coming months, but just be assured that myself and Joe Hoolan also, who sits on that uh, committee, are trying to handle those matters in such a way to ensure that's the best outcome to ensure skill mix is maintained at the appropriate level. The intellectual disability, this was talked about yesterday. Um, there, we formed an expert steering committee within the Irish Nurses and Midwives organization, and I commend all that are involved from the front line and indeed within the organization itself. There is a medication management review ongoing within the health sector, and we're having an ed input in that with the assistance of Dr. Matthews. Indeed, engagement plan with the Department of Health and the HSE in the Section 38 on the role of the RNID. We plan tomorrow afternoon to meet Siobhan O'Halloran, the Chief Nurse, with regards to this issue. And as Ailish referred to earlier, we have a meeting with the Children's Ombudsman uh, next Friday. And having listened to Emily this morning, we'll probably be seeking a meeting uh, with her as well. There's significant issues in the public health and community care uh, there's a lot of um, you know, cheap talk from the HSE with regards to shifting to primary care. They want to shift to primary care but not invest in that area. We have successfully, and Phil initiated this, concluded negotiations with the contracts for public health nurses. The HSE were attempting that their area or location would be within the CHO rather than the local uh, community care area of, say, Cav and Monaghan. Instead, they wanted them across the CHO, like CHO 1, so you could be allocated to work from the top of Donegal to the borders with Cavan and Loud, or um, Carlingford down to Athlone in CHO 8. Again, a ridiculous suggestion. The other thing that they tried to do in that contract was that PHNs would report to the Assistant Director of Public Health Nursing or another designated manager. Again, completely unacceptable that they would interfere with the nurse management structures in that regard, and that's been amended to ensure that the public health nurse reports to the Assistant Director of Public Health Nursing. Also, there's negotiations ongoing with regards to weekend working. I won't go into detail. It is time that this service was probably over a seven-day period, but in the, in, in, at the moment, there is no service at the weekends except for essential calls. And it has to be stated that the payment method with regards to PHNs and CRGNs that make themselves available to do that call is completely unacceptable and we're pursuing that with the HSE. There are other important issues that were talked about already in your motions with regards to MEHEL, which is um, about child protection um, and governance of home health and ca primary care metrics. This is an important issue here. This is the PHN vacancies according to the HSC, so I must give a, a warning with regards to the need for a large pinch of salt with regards to these figures. But these are the HSE's figures with regards to the PHN vacancies that currently exist. As you can see, the Dublin Wicklow area has a major crisis with regards to the number of PHM vacancies. All of you from around the country know that there are significant deficits in your facilities as well. So in excess of 98 vacant posts currently, but it's much more than that because maternity leave isn't covered, annual leave isn't covered. PHNs and CRGNs are out there breaking their backs every day, covering a multitude of areas. And I know about this because I'm married to a PHN and I hear about it every day. But the reality is, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a reality that they're out there doing an extremely difficult job with a lack of support from the HSC. And indeed, we'll be talking about this in the emergency motion number two uh, tomorrow. The other issues, and I'm going to speed up now, um, standing orders. Yep. The pay restoration in Section 39s. Many members of this organization work in Section 39 organizations providing uh, a very valuable contribution to society and caring uh, for people. The reality is that when the FEMPI measures were introduced and the pay of nurses and midwives was cut in the public service, they also moved into the Section 39. And remember, Section 39 workers are not public servants. The reality is this, but they are providing a valuable service to the public. But as soon as them let that legislation came out, the HSE went to the Section 39 organisations and said, make sure you introduce the same cuts that we're introducing in the Section 39 organisations. You would think then that when pay restoration com commenced, 
once it was secured by the unions, that automatically the HSE would be going to the Section 39 organisation saying, restore the pay in line with the public service. No, the HSE went and said, no, no, there's no requirement on you to res restore the pay. Put those nurses and midwives through every rigour you can, whether it's every industrial relations uh, step in the state to get that money back. And indeed, I have to commend the work of all our officials who pursued these issues to the WRC and to the Labour Court. And on foot of that, via the auspices of Patricia King in the, in the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, working with three other unions, we managed to make progress on this issue and a WRC process was set up. An audit is ongoing at the moment. Pay restoration will happen within the Section 39 organisations. It should start to happen in 2018 and will follow through in 2019. And again, Again, it's an example of the INMO leading the way and working with other unions to ensure that pay is restored for workers in Section 39 organisations. The INMO was involved in doing many surveys and submissions, and that's an example of them there. Current ones, uh, there's one's assisted capacity, geo alignment, they're ongoing at the moment. Um, but I think at this point it's important to acknowledge that while we prepare these submissions, we get excellent assistance within the Irish Nurses and Midwives Organisation from Neve and Aileen um, in the library service, who have been fundamental with regards to preparing these submissions. <laughs> And their work has to be acknowledged in that regard. <laughs> Recruitment and retention, the biggest issue and crisis facing the health service at this very moment. The Minister yeah. took an unprecedented step last year of using a, 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 not unprecedented because it was used once before, but he used the step of using a Section 10 in the Health Act 2004. I'm not going to go into much detail with regards to this, but basically it's where the Minister directs the HSE to do certain things with regards to recruitment and retention. The Minister at least acknowledged that there's a significant problem there, even if the HSE are in denial. As a part of that recruitment and retention agreement 2017, a number of issues were to be dealt with. The total nursing workforce, a midwifery workforce, was to increase by 1,204 whole time equivalent by the 31st of December 2017. Like basically every other target the HSE set, it didn't meet it. And they state that they have about 67% of the way there. Um, but the reality is that while the figures may have increased by, that, by approximately 900, just over 850, uh, the reality is that you know on the front line that annual leave, uh, maternity leave, uh, long-term sick leave, etc., has not been replaced. And that's only looking at the funded numbers. And as we stand here today, we have still 2,500 less nurses in the Irish healthcare system than we had in 2007. That's incredible when you think of over the last 11 years, the increase of activity, attendances to emergency departments, and the amount of stuff that's going through um, the various hospitals and the community. So it's incredible that the fact is, 11 years on from 2007, we have 2,500 less nurses and midwives than we had in 2007. The funded workforce plan was to be agreed in 2000, for 2018, last November. So you'd imagine the HSE and the Department of Health would be clear on the number of nurses and midwives they require to deliver the service in 2018. And isn't it absolutely incredible, as I stand before you here in May 2018, the HSE and the Department of Health still do not know what their funded nursing and midwifery workforce plan is for 2018. And that's an absolute disgrace. <laughs> and, and, and to go quickly through this, conversion of posts, the HSE state that they've converted 736 whole time equivalents, yet their budget with regards to agency ex expenditure is still higher than last year. They said they'd convert all posts or people that were on panels at present. And it's an important statistic here. 60% of the people that are on recruitment panels for the HSE are their own staff. It's simply staff 
from one area, whether it's Donegal, looking to move to Cork, have to go through a competition in order to go for that post. So imagine the amount of resources that are wasted in recruitment when 60% of the people on panels waiting to be appointed to a post are already working for the HSE. And that's why the INMO has been to the fore with regards to securing a transfer panel within the services. And I think that is something that we'll pursue vigorously in the next year. No. There's other important issues there. The emergency departments, and I'm going to come to that shortly, but I'm conscious of time. There continue to be significant vacancies with regards to nurses to look after admitted patients. And again, there's a significant problem with regards to filling temporary deficits that arise as a result of resignations, retirements, and maternity leave. These, again, were all of the things that were secured within the recruitment and retention agreement. But again, I'm conscious that I need to move on with regards to the time. But we have secured the appointment of 127 additional CNM1 posts in medical surgical wards. The rehired retired hasn't worked well. The pre-retirement incentive, there was 250 places. Again, not, not met. Again, all of these indicate that there's a significant problem with regards uh, to recruitment and retention. The bring them home campaign that you would have seen at airports, etc. 91 people came back from uh, overseas uh, to work in the Irish healthcare system. It's a damning indictment of the system that 50% of those left within the first year. The reality is that we want to grow the workforce. We need to go back to the 2007 numbers, but think about the increase over the last 11 years. Think about other plans that are in vogue, and it, we need to go way beyond that. I just have to acknowledge the restoration of allowances. We restored those allowances that were taken away in 2012, and it's important that nurses and midwives are aware of their payslip and ensure they're receiving the various allowances that they're entitled to. The Public Service Stability Agreement, and this leads into the emergency motion that's about to come forward. The Public Service Stability Agreement, our members signed up to it last September. What we signed up to it by a margin of 75% in favour and 25 against. The purpose of this agreement is to unwind VEMPI legislation and ensure the sustainability of the public services pension. The pay increases as a result of that agreement, which you're all aware of, 1% in January gone by, 1% next October in 2019 for salaries up to 30,000, an increase of 1%. In October next year, 2019, there will be 1.75%. And in 2020, uh, on the 1st of January, for people on salaries up to 32,000, 0.5%. And the 1st of October, 2020, annualized salaries to increase by 2%. That's what's already within the agreement. But it's important that before we put that to our members, the INMO sought clarifications. Nursing and midwifery recruitment and retention issues should be examined by the Public Service Pay Commission immediately. Pay Commission issue a report recommending options to solving the problems. That's due out in June. The modular approach that we got with regards to this ensures that that report is produced by June 2018 rather than the examination of other areas which would bring us to the end of 2018. So that report by the Public Service Pay Commission is due in the coming weeks. Deeper committed to meeting the INMO with the four, within four weeks of receipt of the proposals. Just graphically, we made a submission to the Public Service Pay Commission with regards to the salaries of nurses and midwives. You are still the lowest paid healthcare professional working in Ireland. The salaries to be compared, this is the salary of a healthcare assistant and a staff nurse. And it's important that healthcare assistants work under the supervision of nurses and are delegated work by the nurses. But you'll see there, as a nurse, you'll have to reach the fifth point of the scale before you surpass the HCA uh, salary. The other issues that are important that we set out to the Public Service Pay Commission is a comparison of the staff nurse salary versus the allied health professional. We looked all over the world with regards to this, and we have a number of examples in Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. You will see, once again, that nursing is at the bottom of the run. But if you look at all those other countries, 
the pay of the allied health professional and the staff nurse is closely aligned, and hence why the INMO has a claim of long-standing with regards to ensuring that nurses are treated the same as other allied health professionals, parity not just in pay, but in hours. The other issues... <laughs> and I am nearly finished. Again, this is another example that once again shows that Ireland is bottom of the league table with regards to the pay of nurses and midwives. And the HSE wonder why the NHS and many other uh, states are in this country actively recruiting our students and actively recruiting our nurses and midwives. The reality is they can offer much better financial packages, career progression and advanced academic support compared to Ireland. But it's very sad that once again, Ireland are bottom of the league table. So the future, and this is my last slide, the, as we stand here before you at the moment, we have a crisis within the emergency department. We have an, a, an ED agreement that has not been fully complied with. I referenced earlier that there are to be 123 nurses appointed to look after admitted patients that have been looked after in our emergency departments that should be in a hospital bed. The HSC broke all records in January, February, March and April this year. The 30% higher April figure than April 2017. The situation is getting worse with regards to overcrowding within our emergency department, but the HSE continue to bury their head in the sand. The ED crisis impacts nurses, health and safety and well-being on a daily basis, but it negatively affects patients. The international research with regards to this would show that in Ireland at the present time, due to overcrowding, we have as many needless deaths within our emergency departments than we have on the roads of Ireland. That's a disgrace. I talked about the fact that we have 2,500 less nurses than we had 11 years ago. If you picture these two people in your head, Charles J. Hawhey and Leo Faradka, uh -huh. the reality is that when Charles Hawhey was Prime Minister or Taoiseach of this country, there were more acute beds within the hospital system than they are now. Isn't that incredible? We have less beds despite, despite the growing population and the significant demographic changes. The reality is the health bed capacity report is issued. We welcome it. It clearly outlines the additional bed capacity that that's required. The government has indicated that they will open up 500 additional beds this year. But the reality is this. Beds are currently closed in the acute, older person setting because of a shortage of nurses and midwives. Therefore, in order to deliver the bed capacity report, you have to invest in nursing and midwife, midwives that involves paying them appropriately and improving the terms and conditions of their employment. Otherwise, the bed capacity report will be a dream. Deputy Roisin Shortall is due to speak to you shortly with regards to the Salon to Care report. Again, we welcome that report. We rel welcome that there's cross-political support with regards to that report. But again, key to delivering that report is the recruitment and retention of nurses. And all of these initiatives are built on sand unless they deal with the issues with regards to nurses' pay and midwives' pay and their terms and conditions of employment. There's a recruitment and retention crisis within the country that we all know about, but the HSE are in denial about. The reality is there are not enough nurses and midwives within the system to care for the patients that present every day. The reality is this, that the, every day when you go to work, where there should be five nurses on a ward, there's often three or maybe less. And that puts patients at risk and it puts the nurse at risk also. There's severe shortages, as I already outlined, with regards to the community shortages. To conclude, I'm going to go back to West Kerry and a small story about a fellow called Paddy O'Shea. There was a story that he was playing an All-Ireland Final. And in that All-Ireland Final, he was marking a famous doctor, David Hickey, who was a famous renal uh, consultant. And at the beginning of the match, David Hickey said to him, did you come up on the train or the bus, Paddy? And it kind of was a jibe at Paddy that he took uh, personally. But as the match went on, anyway, David Hickey got the ball. And 
Paddy stood well back, but when David had the ball, Paddy went at him. And as David Hickey lay prostrate on the ground, Paddy reached over him and said, Was it a bus or a train that hit you? <laughs> Uh, my apologies to Phil for the accent. <laughs> but I think the government and the HSE need to realise that they are going to be hit by the INMO nurses and midwives juggernaut if they don't address the issue of nurses' pay once and for all. Thank you.